नमो तस भगवत अर्हत समुत नमो तस भगवत अर्हत समुत नमो तस भगवत अर्हत समुत Today I'm going to go through the sutta of Saka's questions to the Buddha. This is the twenty-first um, sutta of the Diginakaya, the Saka Panya Sutta. It has a number of. Uh, of unique and interesting features it concerns the um the dewa saka who is the king or supreme deity of the tawatinksa gods coming to earth to have a a meeting with the buddha and they have a, a conversation Thus have I heard, once the Lord was staying in Magadha to the east of Rajagaha by a Brahmin village called Ambasanda, to the north of the village on Mount Widea in the Indasala cave. So already here a, in that name a connection to, to Saka because Saka is Indra, the Vedic god Indra, and the Pali version of uh, the name Indra is Inda, and this is the Inda Sala cave. So the Sala is like a, we call this building the Sala. And it's like a, a pavilion or a, um, a meeting place. And at that time, Saka, Lord of the Gods, felt a strong desire to see the Lord. And Saka thought, where is the Blessed One, the fully enlightened Buddha, now staying? Then perceiving where the Lord was, Saka said to the thirty-three gods, Gentlemen, the blessed Lord is staying in Magadha, in the Indasala cave. How would it be if we were to go and visit the Lord? Very good, Lord. And may good fortune go with you, replied the thirty-two gods. That's the thirty-two gods of Tawatinksa. That's what the name Tawatinksa means. It means thirty-three. Then Saka said to Panchasika of the Gandabas. Panchasika is um, one of the Gandabas. The Gandabas are a lower class of Dewas. They're the uh, heavenly musicians. The Blessed Lord is staying in Magadha in the Indasala cave. I propose to go and visit him. Very good, Lord, said Panchasika, taking his yellow baluva wood lute. He followed in attendance on Saka. This uh, character Panchasika is uh, one of the uh, the Gandavas who comes up often in the stories. Uh, Panchasika means the five tufts. He apparently wore his hair in five tufts, and he was uh, had took the form of a youth, physically very good looking. And the Baluva wood loot he actually acquired from Mara uh, when Mara. Uh, gave up on his last attempt to to um, turn the Buddha aside from the path. He uh, dropped his lute on the ground dejectedly and sat with hung head. And Panchasika basically stole it, picked it up, and <laughs> took it away. So it was, it was originally Mara's lute. It's actually in a. Uh, Actually, the Pali is a vina. It's a, not quite a lute, but it's a similar stringed instrument. He followed in attendance on Saka, and just as swiftly as a strong man might stretch forth his flexed arm or flex it again, Saka, surrounded by the 33 gods and attended by Panchasika, vanished from the heaven of the 33 and appeared in Magadha on Mount Vedea. Then a tremendous light shone over Mount Vedea, illuminating the village of Ambasanda. So great was the power of the gods, so that in the surrounding villages they were saying, Look, Mount Vedea is on fire today. It's burning, it's in flame. What is the matter that Mount Vedea and Ambasanda are lit up like this? And they were so terrified their hair stood on end. This is a, 
a feature of the the, the um, higher classes of beings when they uh, appear in a lower realm, if they're perceived at all, it's only as as light. And this this is so when devas come to earth to the human realm, they're either completely invisible or they're perceived as a, a brilliant light. And it's only with the development of psychic power like the dibachaku, the divine eye, that one can perceive the form of devas unless the devas deliberately choose to manifest in a coarser form. And the same applies to when a Brahma god descends to the level of the devas. There's another sutta where Maha Brahma goes to visit the devas of the 33 and he only appears as a brilliant light at first. Then a tremendous light shone over Mount Wadeo. Oh, I read that bit. Then Saka said, Panchasika, it is hard for the likes of us to get near the Tathagatas when they are enjoying the bliss of meditation and therefore withdrawn. But if you, Panchasika, were first to attract the ear of the Blessed One, we might afterwards be able to approach and see the Blessed Lord, the fully enlightened Buddha. Very good, Lord, said Panchasika, and taking his yellow baluva wood lute, he approached the Indasala cave, thinking, As far as this is neither too far nor too near to the Lord, and he will hear my voice. He stood to one side, and then to the strains of his lute he sang these verses extolling the Buddha, the Dhamma, the Arhants, and love. This this now follows uh, Panchasika's song, and uh, this is kind of a uh, bit comical in a number of ways. One, you know, Saka doesn't want to bother the Buddha, so he sends in his, his um, underling Panchasika to, you know, get his attention. Buddha's in meditation. And then Panchasika, the Gandaba, who remember their musicians, he sings this song that's very inappropriate, let's say. To, you, you can't imagine bothering the Buddha with this. Then the next section, this is Panchasika's song, and it's all in verse. Lady, your father Timbaru, greet, O sunshine fair, I give him honor due. Um, Surya Wachasa, that the name of um, Panchasika's uh, beloved is a, the Gandhava maiden, uh, Surya Wachasa, which uh, uh, means... Uh, Shining sun, sunshine is a good translation, and um, it's said that her uh, her whole body from head to toe glowed glowed like the sun. And so he's uh, he's saying to her to greet your father, give him honor due. By whom was sired a maiden as fair as you, who are the cause of all my heart's delight? Delightful as the breeze to one who sweats, or as a cooling draught to one who thirsts, your radiant beauty is to me as dear as the Dhamma is to the Arahants. So every now and again he throws in one of these comparisons, that are, or kind of the whole thing is really inappropriate. Just as medicine to him who is ill, or nourishment to one who is starving still, bring me, gracious lady, sweet release with cool water from my consuming flames. The elephant oppressed by summer heat seeks out a lotus pond upon which float petals and, and pollen of that flower. So into your bosom sweet I'd plunge. As an elephant urged by the goad pays no heed to pricks of lance and spear, so I unheeding know not what I do, intoxicated by your beauteous form. By you my heart is tightly bound in bonds. All my thoughts are quite transformed and I can no longer find my former course. I'm like a fish that's caught on a baited hook. Come embrace me, maiden fair of thigh. Seize and hold me with your lovely eye. Take me in your arms, it's all I ask. My desire was slight at first, O oh maid, of waving tresses, but it grew apace, as grows the gifts that our hunts receive. Whatever merit I have gained by gifts to those noble ones, may my reward when it ripens be your love most fair. As the Sakyan sun in Janna wrapped, intent and mindful, seeks the deathless goal, thus intent I seek your love, my son. 
Just as the sage would be rejoiced if he were to gain supreme enlightenment, so I'd rejoice to be made one with you. If Saka, lord of three and thirty gods, were perchance to grant a boon to me, it's you I crave, my love, for you so strong. Your father made so wise I venerate, like a sultry blossoming, for his offspring's sake so sweet and fair. So imagine being that cheeky to, to the Buddha. When he heard this, the Lord said, this is the Buddha speaking now, Panchasika, the sound of your strings blends so well with your song and your song with the strings that neither prevails excessively over the other. I think it's quite a diplomatic comment. He's not saying anything about the, com the content of the song. But he's saying, oh, your voice blends well with your flute playing, and your lute playing, and your lute playing blends well with your voice. Uh, when did you compose these verses on the Buddha, the Dhamma, the Arhats, and love? Lord, it was when the Blessed Lord was staying on the banks of the river Naranjara under the goat herd's banyan tree prior to his enlightenment. At that time, I fell in love with the Lady Bada, bright as the sun, daughter of King Timburu of the Gandabas. But the lady was in love with someone else. It was Sikadi, the son of Matali, the charioteer, whom she favored. And when I found that I could not win the lady by any manner of means, I took, took my yellow baluva lute and went to the home of King Tumburu of the Gandabas, and there I sang these verses. And then it's not to repeat in the text, but it's, there's an ellipse that he sings the whole thing again. <laughs> it's just that's like, like the ancient Indian equivalent of standing outside the, the girl's house with a boombox. <laughs> And Lord, having heard the verses, the lady Bada Sarawachasa said to me, Sir, I have not personally seen the blessed Lord, although I have heard him, I heard of him when I went to the Sadama Hall of the 33 gods to dance. And since, sir, you praise the blessed Lord so highly, let us meet today. And so, Lord, I met the lady not then but later. Then Saka thought, Panchasika and the Lord are in friendly conversation. So he called to Panchasika, My dear Panchasika, Salute the blessed Lord for me, saying, Lord Saka, King of the gods, together with his ministers and followers, pays homage to the feet of the blessed Lord. Very good, Lord, said Panchika, and did so. Well, Saka is getting impatient. He said, I sent that Saka in, I sent that Panchasike in to get the Buddha's attention so I can meet with him and talking about his girlfriend. Panchasika, may Saka, King of the gods, his ministers and followers, be happy. For they all desire happiness, Dewas, humans, Asuras, Nagas, Gandabas, and whatever other group of beings there are. For that is the way the Tathagasas greet such mighty beings. After this greeting, Saka entered the Indasala cave, saluted the Lord and stood to one side, and the thirty-three gods with Panchasika did the same. Then in the Indasala cave, the rough passages became smooth, the narrow parts became wide, and the pitch-dark cavern became bright owing to the power of the Dewads. Then the Lord said to Saka, It is wonderful, it is marvelous, that the venerable Kosia, that's another name for Saka, with so much, so many things to do, should come here. Lord, I have long wished to visit the Blessed Lord, but I have always been so busy on behalf of the Thirty-Three that I was unable to come. Once the Blessed Lord was staying at Sawati in the Salala hut, and I went to Sawati to see the Lord. So this is quite a powerful image here. This is narrow, dark cave, and the, the gods enter, and it all becomes wide and vast, spacious hall, brilliantly lit. At that time, the Lord, this is Saka still speaking, at that time, the blessed Lord was seated in some form of meditation. And King Wesawana's wife, Bunjati, was waiting on him, Wesawan is uh, one of the four gods of the um, four great kings. Lady, please salute the blessed Lord for me and say, Saka, king of the gods, with his ministers and followers, pays homage at the Lord's feet. But she said, Sir, it is not the right time to see the blessed Lord. He is in retreat. Well then, lady, when the blessed Lord rises from meditation, please tell him what I have said. Lord, did the lady salute you on my behalf? And does the Lord remember what she said? The Buddha replies, She did salute me, king of the gods, and I remember what she said. I also remember that it was the sound of your chariot wheels that roused me from my meditation. 
<laughs> Considering that the Saka's chariot is, is said to be a yojin along and his a uh, hundred horses, flying horses, the bullet <laughs> probably makes quite a racket. Lord, those gods who arose in the heaven of the 33 before I did have told me and assured me that whenever a Tathagata, a fully enlightened Arahant Buddha, arises in the world, the ranks of the Devas increase and those of the Asuras decline in numbers. In fact, I have witnessed this myself. Now, this is a bit odd. This struck me as a bit odd, this statement. First of all, he says, this is Saka saying the gods who arose in the heaven of the 33 before I did. As that doesn't really fit with the the other story about um, uh, the origin of Saka. When they first came, him and the 33 came up to Tawatinksa, it was inhabited by the Asuras and they threw the Asuras out and took over. So I don't know what gods he's referring to here since he was uh, in the first group that entered Tawatinsa. But these these stories are not always completely consistent. But this does come up in several places, the idea that there's the eternal battle between the Dewas and the Asuras and the fortunes of that war depend largely on the quality of the humans in the earth because if there's a lot of good people uh, keeping the precepts and following the Dhamma, then when they die, they're reborn in the Dewa realm and the Dewa's numbers increase. But if there's a lot of heedless and uh, immoral people, when they die, they become Asuras and swell up the ranks of the Asuras. So the battles at this higher level reflect what's happening on the lower level. And then the Saka goes on, he tells a story about a human woman who was reborn into uh, Tawatinsa. There was, Lord, right here in Kapalawatu, a Sakyan girl called Gopika, who had faith in the Buddha, the Dhamma, and the Sangha, and who observed the precepts scrupulously. She rejected the status of a woman and developed the thought of becoming a man. Then after her death at the breakup of the body, she went to a happy destination, being reborn in a heaven state among the 33 gods as one of, the, the, as one of our sons, known as Gopaka, the Dewa's son, or Dewa Puta. Also, there were three monks who, having observed the holy life under the blessed Lord, had been reborn in the inferior condition of Gandabas. They lived indulging in the pleasures of the five senses as our attendants and servants. And this Gopaka rebuked them, saying, What are you about, sirs, that you did not listen to the blessed Lord's teaching? I was a woman who had faith in the Buddha. I rejected the status of a woman and was reborn among the 33 gods, and am known as Gopaka, the, the Dewa Putta. But you, after having observed the holy life and the blessed Lord, have been reborn in the inferior condition of Gandabas. Oh, so that's still a good rebirth, but it's a lowly one relative to being a full Dewa. It is a sorry sight for us to see our fellows in the Dhamma reborn in the inferior condition of Gandabas. And being thus rebuked, two of those Dewas immediately developed mindfulness and so attained to the realm of the retinue of Brahma, but one of them remained addicted to sense pleasures. This shows a point that it is possible for Dewas to practice the Dhamma and they can then have good results, even become a stream winner. In this case, he was reborn in the Brahma world. So that's that's a much higher level than Tawa thinks of. Then there's a long section in verse, which I don't think I'll go through the whole thing because it's a, it's a bit repetitive, but it's a Gopaka... This, uh, the woman who became reborn as a male Dewa, telling this story in verse, the same same story. At one point she says that um, Saka, on seeing this, uh, these Dewas reborn out of Tawatinsa into the Brahma world, was dismayed and he said, See how these of lesser rank outstrip the gods, the 33. 
Gopaka story also occurs in a slightly different version in the uh, Wamanawatu Sutta, and there's there's a a quite uh, beautiful line I think in that version where Gopaka is rebuking the heedless Gandabas, and uh, he says the circle of the world is too narrow, the 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 realm of Brahma is too low, showing a rejection of samsara because generally the circle of the world the chakawala is considered huge fast you know and, and you know this represents the physical manifestation of samsara it's too narrow and the realm of brahma is considered extremely high and beyond lofty beyond human conception and it's too low you know, the only goal worth worth having this one sight on is nibbana outside of all of this so after this episode the lord thought saka has lived a pure life for a long time whatever questions he may ask will be to the point and not frivolous and he will be quick to understand my answers so the blessed lord replied to saka in verse ask me saka all that you desire on what you ask i'll put your mind at rest so up to this point, they were basically making small talk, you know, uh, courteous greetings and stories, but now he's getting in, Saka's going to ask the Buddha some questions on Dhamma. And uh, being thus invited, Saka, ruler of the gods, put his first question to the Lord. By what fetter, sir, are beings bound? Gods, humans, asuras, nagas, gandabas, and whatever other kind there may be whereby, although they wish to live without hate, harming hostility or malignity, and in peace, yet they live in hate, harming one another, hostile and malign. Because the, uh, the gods of the 33 are not beyond conflict. They still have the conflict with the Asuras. So they, you know, he knows this by, you know, it's within his experience. This was Saka's first question to the Lord, and the Lord replied, Ruler of the gods, it is the bonds of jealousy and avarice that binds beings so that although they wish to live without hate, yet they live in hate, harming one another, hostile and maligned. This was the Lord's reply, and Saka delighted, exclaiming, So it is, Lord, so it is, welfare. Through the Lord's answer, I have overcome my doubt and got rid of uncertainty. It's jealousy that drives the Asuras up the mountain to try and take Tawatinsa. Then Saka, having expressed his appreciation, asked another question. But sir, what gives rise to jealousy and avarice? What is their origin? How are they born? How do they arise? Owing to the presence of what uh, do they arise? Owing to the absence of what do they not arise? Jealousy and avarice, ruler of the gods, take rise from like and dislike. That is their origin. That is how they are born. That is how they arise. When these are present, they arise. When these are absent, they do not arise. So this whole dialogue goes on in the same, same vein, and it has the, um, the same form or spirit as the dependent origination, which is a common theme of the Buddhist teaching, that things arise according to causes, and you can analyze and trace back the causes. So jealousy and avarice arise from liking and disliking, and what do they arise from? They arise from desire. You know, and then each, each, one, each section is the whole long paragraph, but I'll just do the, the main points. So uh, liking and disliking arise from desire. And what gives rise to desire? Desire, ruler of the gods, arises from thinking. When the mind thinks about something, desire arises. When the mind thinks about nothing, desire does not arise. But sir, what gives rise to thinking? Thinking, ruler of the gods, arises from the tendency to proliferate. That is a papancha. That's a, a term that's... Um, been translated proliferation it's the tendency of the mind to weave complicated stories and narratives and structures and you get lost in that 
When this tendency is present, thinking arises. When it is absent, thinking does not arise. Then uh, Saka asks another question. What practice has that monk undertaken who has reached the right way which is needful and leading to the cessation of the tendency to proliferation? So how do you put a stop to this papancha? And Buddha's reply, Ruler of the gods, I declare there are two kinds of happiness, the kind to be pursued and the kind to be avoided. The same applies to unhappiness and equanimity. Why have I declared this in regard to happiness? This is how I understand happiness. When I observe that in the pursuit of such happiness, unwholesome factors increase and wholesome factors decrease, then that happiness is to be avoided. When I observe that in the pursuit of such happiness, unwholesome factors decrease and wholesome factors increase, then that happiness was to be sought after. Now, of such happiness as accompanied by thinking and pondering, and of that which is not so accompanied, the latter is more excellent. The same applies to unhappiness and to equanimity. And this ruler of the gods is the practice the monk has undertaken who has reached the right way, leading to the cessation of the tendency to proliferate. And Saka expressed delight in the Lord's answer. So there is a... Uh, a bit of a reference here to, to the jhana and the progression in the jhanas. When the Buddha says, such happiness as is accompanied by thinking and pondering, and that not so accompanied, the latter is more excellent. Happiness is sukha, and thinking and pondering here in Pali is vitaka vichara, the jhana factors. So the first jhana has vitaka vichara, and the second and subsequent jhanas, vitaka vichara, are absent. So that the that uh, happiness is more excellent. The um, the quality of thinking and pondering, the thought formation. Uh, is ultimately incompatible with the bliss states. Then Saka, having expressed his appreciation, asked another question. Well, sir, what practice has that monk undertaken who has acquired restraint required by the rules? Ruler of the gods, I declare there are two kinds of bodily conduct to be pursued and the kind to be avoided. The same applies to conduct of speech and to the pursuit of goals. Why have I declared this in regard to bodily conduct? And this, then he goes into the same, same thing about wholesome and unwholesome factors. So any bodily contact or mental contact or any goal that increases unwholesome factors is to be avoided. And if it increases wholesome factors, is to be undertaken. Then Saka asked another question. Well, sir, what practice has that monk undertaken who has acquired control of his sense faculties? Ruler of the gods, I declare that things perceived by the eye are of two kinds, the kind to be pursued and the kind to be avoided. The same applies to things perceived by ear, nose, tongue, body, and mind. At this, Saka said, Lord, I understand in full the true meaning of what the Blessed One has outlined in brief. Lord, whatever object perceived by the eye, if the pursuit leads to increase of unwholesome factors and the decrease of wholesome factors, that is not to be sought after. And so on. So it's Saka here. So this is a minor point here that Saka himself fills in the uh, the rest of the formula. He's, under, he's got the general principle. Then Saka asks another question. Sir, do all ascetics and Brahmins teach the same doctrine, practice the same discipline, want the same thing, pursue the same goal? No, ruler of the gods, they do not. But why, sir, do they not do so? The world, ruler of the gods, is made up of many and various elements. Such being the case, beings adhere to one or other of these various things, and whatever they adhere to, they become powerfully addicted to and declare, this alone is the truth, everything else is false. Therefore, they do not all teach the same doctrine, practice the same discipline, and want the same thing, pursue the same goal. So are all ascetics and Brahmins fully proficient, 
freed from bonds, perfect in the holy life? Have they perfectly reached the goal? No, ruler of the gods. Why is that, sir? Only those ruler of the gods who are liberated by the destruction of craving are fully proficient, freed from bonds, perfect in the holy life, and have perfectly reached the goal. And Saka rejoiced at the answers as before. Then Saka said, Passion, sir, is a disease, a boil, a dart. It seduces a man, drawing him into this or that state of becoming, so that he is reborn in high states or low. Whereas other ascetics and Brahmins of different viewpoints gave me no chance to ask these questions, the Lord has instructed me at length and thus removed the dart of doubt and uncertainty from me. The Buddha asks, Ruler of the gods, do you admit to having asked the same question of other ascetics and Brahmins? Yes, Lord. Then if you don't mind, please tell me what they said. I do not mind telling the blessed Lord or one like him. Then tell me, ruler of the gods. Lord, I went to those I considered to be ascetics and Brahmins because of their solitary life in the woods. And I put these questions to them. But instead of giving me a proper answer, they asked me in return, Who are you, venerable sir? I replied, I was Saka, Lord of the Gods, and they asked me what had brought me here. Then I taught them the Dhamma as far as I had heard it and practiced it, and they were very pleased with even that much. And they said, We have seen Saka, the Lord of the Gods, and he has answered the questions put to him. And they became my pupils instead of my becoming theirs. So Saka is frustrated. He goes to these different holy men, and they're just blown away by by uh, seeing, seeing the king of the Dewas and he doesn't can't get a can't get any answer out of them and so he ends up telling them what he knows and they became my pupils instead of my becoming theirs but I Lord am a disciple of the blessed Lord a stream winner not subject to rebirth in the states of woe firmly established and destined for enlightenment. Now that, this is another line that is a bit um, inconsistent. Here, Saka is claiming to be a stream winner, a Sotapanna, but we see later, a few pages later in this uh, sutta, it said that he attained stream entry then and there. So he couldn't have been a stream enter already at this point. There's some bit of inconsistency has got into the text here. Ruler of the gods, do you admit to having ever experienced such rejoicing and happiness as you are experiencing now? Yes, Lord. And what was that about? In the past, Lord, war had broken out between the gods and the Asuras, and the gods had defeated the Asuras. And after the battle, as victor, I thought, whatever is now the food of the gods... And what is the food of the Asuras? Henceforth we shall enjoy both. But Lord, such happiness and satisfaction, which was due to blows and wounds, does not conduce to dispassion, detachment, cessation, peace, higher knowledge, enlightenment, nibbana. But that happiness and satisfaction that is obtained by hearing the Dhamma from the Blessed Lord, which is not due to blows and wounds, does conduce to dispassion, detachment, cessation, peace, higher knowledge, Enlightenment, Nibbana. And ruler of the gods, what things do you call to mind when you admit to experiencing such satisfaction and happiness as this? Lord, at such times six things come to mind at which I rejoice. Then there's some verses, which I'm going to, it's not very long, so I'll go through it. But they're, they're a bit cryptic, and it, it's um, Saka prophesizing his own future rebirths. And there are different ways of understanding exactly what he means by some of the phrases. But I won't get into all that controversy. I'll just go through this. I, who merely as a god exist, have gained the chance by Kama of another earthly light. So that's the very first stanza is, is interesting, that he's regarding an earthly life as being more desirable than a, than a life as a Dewa. Leaving this non-human realm of gods behind, unerringly I'll seek the womb I wish to find. So that's a reference to a human birth, because gods are not born born into a womb. 
my problem solved, I'll gladly live by Buddha's side, by Buddha's law, controlled and mindful, with clear awareness filled. So his desire to be reborn human comes from a desire to practice the Dhamma. So this is not common amongst Dewas. He's a very uh, enlightened, far-thinking, far-seeing Dewa. Most of them are so wrapped up in their sense pleasures, they wouldn't think this way. And should thereby enlightenment arise in me, as one who knows I'll dwell and there await my end. And when I leave the human world again, I'll be once more a god and one of highest rank. More glorious than the Dewas are the peerless gods, the Akanita Dewas of the, uh, the pure land, uh, Sudawasa. So, he's, so that would imply that he would be an anagami at this point. Among whom dwelling I shall make my final home. Okay, so then he's, it's another longish verse where he's uh, just basically praising the Buddha and the Buddha's teaching. And then it it winds up, the Saka, the Lord of the Gods, said to Panchasika of the Gandhabas, you have been of great help to me for gaining the ear of the Blessed Lord, for it was through your gaining of his ear that we were admitted to the presence of the Blessed Lord, the Arahant, the Supreme Enlightened Buddha. I will be a father to you, and you will be king of the Gandhabas, and I will give you Bada Suryavacha, whom you desired. And then the Saka, Lord of the Gods, touched the earth with his hand and called out three times, Homage to the Blessed One, the Arahant, the Supreme Enlightened Buddha. Homage to the Blessed One, the Arahant, the Supreme Enlightened Buddha. Homage to the Blessed One, the Arahant, the Supreme Enlightened Buddha. And while he had been speaking in this dialogue, the pure and spotless Dhamma eye arose within Saka, ruler of the gods, and he knew whatever things of an origin must come to cessation. And the same thing happened to 80,000 Dewas as well. Such were the questions which Saka, Lord of the Gods, was desirous to ask, which the Lord answered to him. Therefore, this discourse is called Saka's Questions. So the pure and spotless Dhamma eye arose within Saka. That's a, that's a, a phrase that occurs frequently to indicate someone has attained stream entry. That's the, the opening of the Dhamma eye, the Dhamma Chaku. So, um, stream entry is the purification of the view. And uh, Saka declared, whatever things have an origin must come to cessation. That's the same declaration that um, Kandanyo made at the, um, the Buddha's first sermon when he attained stream entry. And it says the same thing happened to 80,000 Dewas as well. You know, there's always have to be 80,000 80, of this and 84,000 of that. Right? But here, here's, here's um, the point at which Saka becomes a stream winner. And there's a, even more depth to this in, um, in the commentary. It's uh, it's not stated in the sutta, but it's in the commentary that the reason Saka went to see the Buddha was because he had seen the five signs, which is when a dewa reaches the end of their very long lifespan, before they die, they're given a warning. Uh, they see five signs. This is their version of old age, you know, you know, so much milder than human old age. The five signs are. Uh, their garments become soiled, their garlands fade, they lose their their luster, or their luster dims, their armpits grow sweaty, and they become restless on their seat. So then they see that coming, oh, my lifespan is coming close to an end. So Saka knew he was, he was dying, basically, from his Dewa state, so he went to see the Buddha. And the commentary says that uh, at this, at right at the end of this discourse, as he was praising the Buddha, homage to the Buddha, Saka actually did die, but because of his excellent kama, he was immediately reborn as the new Saka. So, there's, and the only, and all these other dewas hanging around didn't notice anything. The only two that knew knew that that had happened were Saka himself and the Buddha. And he he uh, because the. Uh, it's just like 
thing we said previously about Mara, Saka is, uh, there's always a Saka in the universe, but the being Saka is not immortal. He's uh, He dies, then there's a new Saka. But they live for some millions and millions of uh, human earth years. So this is one of the, the suttas where uh, the Buddha is teaching the devas. This is when we when we chant the Atipi So chant, one of the um, one of the attributes of the Buddha is teacher of gods and men. So you know the Buddha did uh, teach uh, devas and also brahmas. Uh, he was. Uh, you know, he was in that higher position of understanding than even the gods. And this is brought out in the incident in this in this sutta where Saka goes to these other ascetics and Brahmins, you know, various non-Buddhist holy men in India and uh, tried to see what they could tell him. And they just uh, started to worship him instead. So, but the Buddha is actually... You know, takes takes it seriously and and teaches him dhamma. There are other encounters of the Buddha and Saka elsewhere in the in the canon, but this is the longest continuous uh, episode of the Buddha in discourse with Saka. Sadhu, 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 animal demi.